Welcome everyone to another APH Virtual Excel Camp. This week is Transition Age and we are going around the world. We are so happy to have you with us. Feel free to drop in the chat who you are and where you're from. I don't know if we're still sticking with our teams. We're going to find out from our instructors. So again, I'm saying welcome to another virtual Excel camp from APH this week, Transition Age, and we are going around the world. We have people coming in. Say hello in the chat. We're glad you're with us today. Giving you a chance to go around the world. Who is going to join us going around the world? Well, let's talk about who your instructors are. Your instructors today are Joanne Challen, an orientation and mobility instructor. Say hello, Joanne. Hi, everybody. And Robin Keating Clark, a vision rehabilitation therapist. Hello, Robin. Hola. And we have our student intern, Susie Drake. Hello, Susie from Missouri State University. Hello, everyone. And so those are your instructors. We're so happy to have you with us today. I am glad to see hellos in the chat and I am going to turn it over to your instructors. Have lots of fun. Let's see where we go. All right, everyone. We are excited to pick up with day two of our international jet setting. We are playing the amazing race expanded core curriculum style. So if you were not with us yesterday or tuning in to just today, we were yesterday in New York City and living the dream in the Big Apple. And right at the end of our lesson, we boarded our plane to a new location. So you may know or you may not know where we're going, but I want you to pretend that we're about five miles from landing and we're starting to hear the messages that come when you're about to land. And our message is actually going to be a clue about where we are going. And this clue is from somebody very special. We have a Paralympian. We have Nancy Stevens, who will give us a clue. So listen up, everybody, to our clue. If your chat window is not open, make sure you have opened up your chat window. And I think we can ask Leanne, who is one of our flight attendants, to play our audio clue for us. And of course, I can't find my audio clue. So hang on. That's yes, okay. You're more than fine. You know what? I just want to see everybody coming in in the chat. If you haven't had a chance to say hello, tell us hello. Try to say it in a new language. So I went with hola. Oh, yo, Darren, I love it. Oh, bonjour. Hello, Hannah Hart. Oh, yes, Camille's got it too. Oh, ni hao. Very nice, Michael. Oh, look at this. This is fantastic. What a nice plane ride right now. There is like no turbulence. We're just cruising at altitude. It's so nice. All right, Leanne, are we ready? We're ready. Listen All right, up. Listen up, everyone. Hello, I am Nancy Stevens. I'm using my note taker to read my clue to you today, so you may hear those little pins in the background. I participated in 1998 in the Paralympics in three cross-country ski races in the women's B1 category. I was in the five kilometer classic race, the five kilometer skate race, and the 15 kilometer classic race. This country is well known for cherry blossoms, Mount Fuji, sumo wrestling, and the bullet train. It is only an 80 to 100 minute ride on a bullet train from Nagano to Tokyo. What country and continent am I describing? Oh, what a cool clue. All right, everybody, start to put your ideas in there. Where do you think we're going? 
Oh, a lot of people have got some ideas. We've got a special guest with us. If you have vision, you can see it's a man. He's got flight wings on with a dress shirt. He's actually a real flight attendant. And he's going to give us another clue about where we're going. みなさま、長らくの空の旅お疲れ様でございました。ご到着機はただいま関西国際空港に到着いたしました。ただいまの時刻は午前3時5分、7月8月5日でございます。ベルト着用さんが消えるまではお座りのままお待ちください。これより先
Um, and Joanne, can you also look as well? Because Alexander would like to know and Anna. So we'll take a hot second and go back and remind everybody of what teams you are on. Alex is on team four. Thank you. And who else needs to know? Um, we have another student, Abrienda. I don't quite remember her name. I'm not seeing Abrienda on any list. So, so we are gonna add her to a team. We're gonna put her on team four because they need a few other players. All right. Oh, Brianna, I see you asking me questions. I cannot talk about that just yet. I cannot talk about it just yet. All right, let's get ready to do our challenges. Here is our first one. Can you name three different types of Japanese foods? Can you add three different types of Japanese foods? Go ahead and say it in the chat window. Ooh, I see dumplings, I see sushi, I see rice, fried rice. I don't know about fried rice. Tempura, ooh, ramen, Alexander. Wait a minute, Keenan, our Japanese friend, will you please tell us, is Alexander correct with sushi, tempura, and ramen? Alexander Kober, you are absolutely correct. 100% sushi, tempura, and ramen are all very traditional Japanese dishes. Ooh, I also see Darren saying quin is that quinoa? I don't know about that one. Do a lot of Japanesians, oh, I should have practiced that one. Um, people of Jap Japan, do, do they eat a lot of quinoa? In my opinion, quinoa is probably a rather uncommon dish in Japan. Okay, so on our list of foods, we have sushi, ramen and tempura. There's one more that is a noodle in broth. Can anybody name that one? It starts with an S. It's a four letter word. It's noodles that are in broth. You might not have heard of this one. So just in case, we're gonna expand your horizons. Oh, Camille, what a good guess. Oh, Kennedy Faith, yes. You got it, girlfriend. That's one for your team, Soba. Okay, now can anybody tell me what does tempura mean? Tempura, I'm gonna type it into the chat so you can see what it looks like. What does tempura mean? Bonus point, last part of this challenge, who can tell us? Well, Hannah, yes, it is a type of food. But what kind of food? Tell us about it. Is it ice cream? Is it a noodle? Lasagna? What type? Can anybody share? What is tempura? Oh, Whitney's guessing seafood. Oh, I see a lot of seafoods, meats, noodles, maybe a sushi? Not pasta. Sorry, Abrienda. I was bringing you down the wrong road when I said lasagna. All right. Tempura, this is your new learning topic right here. I'm gonna put it into the chat. Means light and crispy, it's deep fried. So you can have tempura shrimp, you can have tempura vegetables. In fact, if you don't like to eat vegetables, tempura might be the way you might like them because they're battered and deep fried, baby. They are so good. So after hearing that description, who here would like to eat tempura foods? Ooh, I see Keenan with his hand up. So next time you go, Susie's in. The next time you order in from a Japanese restaurant, ask what they have tempura style. Okay, that was challenge one. I am turning it over to challenge two with Joanne. All right, everybody's probably really hungry now. But let's think a minute. We just arrived in Japan. Who can tell me how many people live? What, well, first, let's backtrack for a minute. Does anyone know the capital city of Japan? You type it in the chat. Ooh, that took just a hot second. Tokyo, all right. You guys are on the ball. F, K, 
here's the bonus question. How many people live in Tokyo, which is the biggest city in Japan? Is it one? Is it two? 100,000? 200,000? Should we go up or should we go down? Let's think about that one for a second. How many people? Is it bigger Ooh, than New York? Happening. Nine million. Well, we're getting warmer. I think we still need to go up. Oh, and remember, there's a lot of people that live yeah. in Tokyo. 50 Ooh. million. We're pretty close. All right, a little bit lower. Something between 9 million and 15 million. And one more. Ah, we have, we have someone who got it. All right, we have 13 million people. That's just a few people that live in Tokyo. It's a lot of people. Can you imagine when they're crossing the street? It's a lot of people crossing the street at the same time. Probably busy in New York City. And, all right, great job. All right, we're gonna pass it on to Susie for question number three. All right, here's your last challenge before we can get off this plane and go to Japan. So, you know that here in America, we have a lot of fun pastimes. One of which is baseball. We also enjoy football. So it wouldn't surprise you they have a national support sport. Can you tell me the national sport is? The national sport. It's different. Oh, it is not baseball. It's the official sport. Sumo wrestling! Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome, guys. It is sumo wrestling, which is kind of cool. Um, the next question I'm going to ask you, what is the most popular spectator sport? So the most popular thing that people go to watch. So it's a little different. Watch the most when they're in Japan. Baseball, yes. So they like to go watch baseball, just like here. In the United States, we really like game in the summer. So you have accomplished all three challenge questions. And that means we get to get off this plane. Keenan, so Keenan, do we have any special directions for repeat that for me once more? Oh no, Susie, please. cut out for a hot second. Do we have any special direct plane? As we disembark the airplane, we most certainly do. Tochi no kyon ga taihen atsuku natte orimasu. Kinai no ondo wa hikuku tamotsu tame ori no naru ori ni naru mae ni mado no hiyoke o oroshi kuchou no fukitashi guchi no tsumami o mawashite which in Japanese means in Japan it's very summer. The temperature right now in Tokyo is well over 80 degrees and humid. So in order to keep the airplane cool for the next passengers, if you would kindly lower your window shades. Arigato gozaimasu. Oh, yes, we want to keep everything cool and clean because it is definitely warm. Okay, I don't know about anybody here, but now that we've been on that super long flight and we're finally off the plane, guess what? We need to go get some food. Anybody interested in going to get some food while we're in Japan? Oh, yeah, tell us in the chat what you're interested in. Yes, everybody's with us. Perfect. All right, so now we're going to get into our five-minute lesson about talking about going to a restaurant. Now, I'm sure everybody here has been to a restaurant, but one of the things that you should know or remember is that when we say restaurant, we could mean all different types of restaurants. So what I want you to do is tell me in the chat 
or you can even raise your hand. What are some different types of restaurants? Not names of restaurants, but types of restaurants. So I see one virtual hand up already. Anna. Um, fine dining. Yes, Hannah, well done. All right, so we've heard fine dining. Now I see sit down, yep, they're called family style. There's fast food. I saw Camille said formal. It's also known as upscale. Yes, all right, perfect. So everybody's giving, oh, Darren, buffet, of course, dear. We need to always remember the buffet. So now everybody's giving some types of restaurants. Let's match the name of a restaurant to the type of restaurant. So what I would like to see, could anybody tell me in the chat window, give me a name of a restaurant. Let's see, who's got some fast fingers? Okay, so Hannah, but Hannah already mentioned that. Hannah already started us off with fast food, McDonald's. Okay, guys, here's what I want you to do. I want everybody to name as many fast food restaurants as you can. Name your fast food restaurants. Yep, Camille, name in Lorenza. It's a Nebraska thing. Burger King, Chick-fil-A. Yes, Taco Bell. That's what I'm talking about. All right, KFC. Perfect. Everybody's getting it. Fast food. Okay, now who can tell me a casual restaurant? A casual, or sometimes it's called fast casual, meaning the food comes fast, but you can sit down and eat. So, yep, Hannah named Cafe Rio. Um, Kennedy Faith, uh, Noodle, like Noodles and Company, yes. Rihanna is saying wasabi, which I hope that is a type of restaurant in Virginia. Starbucks could be one. Have you ever heard of a place called Chipotle? Chipotle is a fast casual restaurant because you can order, but the food goes really fast, but they make it kind of for you. Um, Jimmy John's could even be considered that way. Panda Express, Panera. Oh my gosh, I love Panera. There is no Panera in Utah and it breaks my heart. Um, yes, yeah, so all of these places, Cafe Zupa's. Oh, perfect. Okay, now who can tell me a type of family restaurant or casual? You're gonna need a menu for this restaurant at your table. Chilies, cheddars, yes, those are all ones. Um, does anybody like Red Robin? Applebee's, Chewy's, great. You guys, you don't even need me to teach you about restaurants because you totally guess the different types. Ooh, Red Lobster, absolutely. Perfect. Everybody's naming some great types of family sit-down restaurants. Okay, now let's talk about what are some things you should know about accessing the menu. And when we say access the menu, and I'm typing this in the chat window, when we type in access the menu, we mean asking a question like how to read the menu. So how do we read the menu in any of these types of restaurants. So I see Darren ask if they have a braille menu. And guess what, everybody? I'm gonna say that that's something you don't wanna do. Does anybody know the downsides of asking for a braille menu? And if you wanna raise your digital hand, you can. So there, there's a big downside for asking for the Braille menu. Oh, Darren, you're already answering it. Yeah, they could be or likely are outdated, not updated. In fact, I bet you're going to ask the server that question and they're going to go, uh, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Do, do we have one? Do you want me to tell it to you in sign language? I mean, they're not going to know where that Braille menu is. So how can you access it? So Whitney is saying I use uh, on my, the one on my phone with voiceover and I saw some other people say that. Yeah, one of the easiest ways that you can access the menu or read the menu, use your phone, use your technology. There's one other person that you could use to read the menu. Does anybody know who that special person is that you could use? 
You could maybe use a family member, maybe your parents, but what if you're there with your friends? There's somebody else at the restaurant that can help you out. Oh, very good. The worker, better known as the server. Did you know that the server or the waitress or the waiter, they have to know every part of the menu so they can give you any information. So you can ask a server, hey, what kind of burgers do you have? And they'll tell it to you and the price. So you can always ask the server. So the one of the biggest parts of going to any restaurant is being able to access the menu. And everybody has given some great tips on how you can do that. But now there's another big thing that you need to know. And that is, how do you get around at a restaurant? So we're gonna turn it over to our mobility mama. I don't know if anybody's ever called her that before, but I thought it would be fun. We're gonna turn it over to our mobility mama, Joanne, and she's gonna share some tips about being successful with your mobility skills. All right, got a new name today. All right, um, so. You're eating out. You could be eating out here. You could be eating out there. So what are you going to do? What are some similarities? You're at the restaurant, but you have to find your seat. But if you're in Japan, what type of seat do you think you have in a restaurant? Is it a traditional seat? It is it a... Hmm. So are you going to be sitting on the ground? Or are you going to be sitting in a chair? What do you think? Hmm, you sit on the ground, you'd like a pillow on it. And maybe Keenan can fill us in on some of the fancy words that some of us are still learning a little bit and tell us about those seats. Absolutely, Joanne, thank you. So the pillows that Megan is referring to, the Japanese word for the pillow is zabuton, zabuton. Z-A-B-U-T-O-N, and it's a square pillow that is very comfortable to sit on. Thanks so much. And so you sit on a, excuse if I'm, me if I mispronounce it, Zabuton. And you have to find your Zabuton, but how are you going to find it? So how are you going to know if it's over there? If it's over here, if someone tells you it's over there, what do they need to do? They need to give you what kind of directions to tell you where to, where you can have a seat. They could guide you. You could go with a friend. You could use, you could have someone guide you or you could ask for specific directions. It's in front of you, it's beside you, it's to your left, it's to your right. And you'll notice that the directions are from your perspective, not from theirs. From yours. So they need, is it clock directions? Is it at nine o'clock? Is it at three o'clock? Is it at 12 o'clock? Is it at six o'clock? All those descriptors would help you find your seat. So you found your seat and your meal's being delivered, being brought to you rather, and you have your lovely cup of tea. So how are you going to know where your cup of tea is located? Hmm. How would someone describe where your cup of tea? Clock directions. Good. So you can use your clock directions to find your tea. You can find your sushi. All of your different food items. And that's how you would get around the restaurant. Now, the last thing, you're done with your meal. Someone, how do you find the exit? How do you find out how to leave the restaurant? What are you going to do? Well, how did you get in? Could you reverse what you did? Could you reverse your route? Could someone guide you? You could use your cane. And if you recognize a few basic words in Japanese, you might recognize the sign, if you could see it, that says exit. So that's how you get along a restaurant. If you really want to go all out, you can make a map. You can talk with your friends about it. There are a bunch of things you could do. But most importantly, enjoy your time and have a good meal. Thanks so much.
All right. Well, now that we know how to get around a restaurant, we feel pretty good about what we have learned here. We're going to switch gears a little bit and turn it back over to Kanan, and he's going to tell us a little bit about life in Japan. Domo arigato, Robin, which in Japanese, of course, everyone means. Let's see if you know in the, in the chat. I'm reading your comments. Domo arigato. Exactly, Kennedy. That is correct. Robin, it could mean that. <laughs> good one. Very good, Camille and Dia. Domo arigato is a very simple way, very casual way to say thank you. So thanks, Robin, for passing the virtual mic over to me. So ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, my name again is Keenan, and I was born in the northern part of Honshu, which is the largest island in Japan on a tiny little military Air Force base called Misawa, where I lived for a short while, left, and then came back when I was younger, when I was still young, from the years of six through 13, seven years I spent living in Japan and I have so many wonderful memories of living there in Japan. Currently, I live in Chicago, where compared to Hawaii, which is home for me, is very cold, as you can imagine, in the winters. However, after living here in Chicago for 23 years, still here, but growing up and living in Aomori, Honshu in uh, Misawa, Japan. The weather is very much like Chicago. It's very cold and windy. As a matter of fact, in Aomori, they have some of the highest recorded records of snowfall in the world. Again, the city is called Aomori, and this is on the northernmost, this is the northern tip of the largest of the islands of Japan. Do any of you have any guesses as to how many major inhabited islands there are in the country of Japan? Let's see some of your guesses in the chat. How many islands are there in Japan? We have guess of nine from Brianna, Michael four, Camille 10, 15. Michael Munn, you are actually correct. Four of the major inhabited islands in Japan are from the very northernmost Hokkaido. Hokkaido is a very snowy, mountainous uh, island. Dia, that is correct as well. There are four islands. Hokkaido, the main long island in the center, Honshu, two smaller islands to the south, Kyushu and Shikoku. This island's chain of four islands, which lays out in the uh, Pacific Ocean off the coast of, of the Asian continent of China and Korea, make up primarily the uh, country of Japan, which again is almost like a second home to me because that's where I was born. That's where I was raised as a child and I was fortunate enough to live there another two years after college. And now, as I was first introduced, my career brings me to and from Japan almost once a week. It's been a little while since I've been there given the, the state of things in our world today. However, Japan will always have a place in my heart. And yes, it is a fun second home. Thank you. Once a week travels to Japan, where it, it was the life, let me tell you. So you've learned so many wonderful things about, about Japan, about food, about culture, and about getting around in Japan. Alexander, that's wonderful. I'm going to take a second in to read exactly what you said, because Alexander's comment is in Japanese. 私はその、この3年間日本語を話し方を習っていますが、日本のテレビゲームはやアニメが好きなのでそうしたいという気になりました。Very impressive. I hope I read that right. Did I read that right, Robin? Wait, I think what we need to do, Alexander, can you unmute? <laughs> do you speak Japanese? Cuz I feel like yesterday and today you've been typing to us in Japanese and I want to know how you know this. So are you there, Alexander, to unmute? Oh, maybe not. Oh, he doesn't know how to mute. Space bar. Hold down the space bar. Hold on. Let me find his name first. Okay. And, and Leanne's going to help you as well. Because he's been throwing out Japanese to us like 
all the time. So we got to let this cat out of the bag. Okay, yeah. Alexander, I have un. Okay, am I unmuted? You are Hi. unmuted. So, so. Right, um, wait, can you hear me? Yeah. Loud and clear. Okay, so, um, uh, yeah, so, like, I've been learning Japanese for the last few years, um, because I have, like, an interest in a lot of things that come from there, and, uh, um, um, and also, um, um, and also I have my phone set to Japanese as well, and I, um, um, and I, and I usually, um, and I usually, um, I usually play a lot of my video games in Japanese as well. Like I'll import the Japanese versions of them just to do in that language. Um, but even for but even for games that were made in America, I'll still like play them in Japanese to get more experience with it. And I've also been learning Japanese online, um, like, uh, um, um, like through Skype um, with a Japanese teacher f for the last three years. And I've and I'm and I'm going to keep learning until I'm fluent. I'd say you're pretty good. Can you speak some Japanese for us? Like speak oh, well, something to Kenan? I'll just smile. Um, so, like, um, I'm, be I'm better at writing it than speaking it, but um, uh, um, I guess I can, I guess I can try speaking Take it. Take a um, shot, Alexander. It'll be better than mine. Okay, um, wait, wait, should I introduce myself or sure. like, because I, yeah. okay. go for it. Um, okay, I'll, I'll try and remember what it is. Um, Alexander。I can't do that. That was great. Thank you so much for sharing with us. Yeah. Alexander, that was amazing. Your pronunciation is perfect. I can tell Thanks. you're being being uh, taught and instructed by someone native, and it really makes a difference. So what I would say to you is, ganbatte kudasai, which means keep it up. You're doing such a great job, and I know that your personal interests in in games and and other Japanese culture related things are what's going to drive you and inspire you to keep going. So keep on, keep on doing, Alexander. It's sounding awesome. Great job. Keep yeah. it up. Thank you. Thank you. Domo arigato. And I'll yeah. hit mute for you, so you don't have to worry. All right. That was amazing. And I was reading a lot of other people's comments, too, about uh, what they know about Japan, how many islands there are, the language, and, and the food, of course. So while I was born and raised in the northern part of Japan, where, like the state of California, it's very long. You've got northern California, and regionally, you've got different climates. You've got different cuisines. You've got different dialects or accents. So from the opposite point of where I was born in northern Japan, if you travel down to southern Japan in a very different region called Kansai, K-A-N-S-A-I, Kansai or Osaka, this is one of my favorite places to travel. Any guesses why I like to fly to Kansai? Hmm. Let's see. The beaches? Not beaches. I love the beaches. Okay, food. Hmm. See, Hiroshima is an area not far from Kansai, and there are so many different types of animals that live in all of Japan. Not an ice cream truck. Yes, it's a very mountainous region. Uh, the center of Japan is basically the mountain range. We heard from our Paralympian earlier who competed in the Nagano Olympics. It was the Winter Olympics, which means there had to have been lots of skiing and activities, which means there's lots of mountains and snow in Japan. Similarly, just miles away from the mountains are beautiful beaches in Japan. Absolutely. But we're not talking about mountains or beaches in the Kansai region. We're talking about my favorite thing, and that's food. We talked about food earlier but I'm going to share a little bit about what the Kansai Osaka region of Japan is known for. So I'm actually going to type this into the chat so that you can all practice saying this. And let me see if you, uh oh, all right. I have it typed in there, Robin. Maybe you can help me. If I don't just hit the enter button to send. 
Um, just make sure you hit all panelists and attendees in your two. I've got everyone selected. They're all panelists and attendees. And I've got my hey, yeah, little... Try typing something. Type and... Hmm. Hitting the enter button isn't sending it, unfortunately. Oh, no. Hmm. Well, we will continue to troubleshoot what that... Could... Oh, there we go. I got it. Okay, I figured it out. All right, so this is a, a Japanese word. It's a compound word. Compound meaning it's a combination of two words. You have K-U-I-D-A-O-R-E. Hmm, that's a lot of vowels and a couple of consonants mixed in there. Let's see how one would pronounce this word. It's kui daore. Kui daore. Go ahead and say that with me. Kui daore. The Kansai or Osaka region of Japan was known as this nickname, Kui Daore. Now, let me explain the two different compound, compound words. Kui means to eat. It's a very casual way of eating food. So you have eating something. Okay, what's the second half of the word Daore? When um, Taoreru, a verb, Taore means to fall over. Hmm, so when you put the two words together, what do you folks think that means? Let me know in the chat what your thoughts are about what kui daore means. All right. Dia, chakra board, I think you're on to something there. There we go. I like these answers. And Gemma, I think you're on to something because the food indeed in the Kansai region, again, they're given this nickname for a reason, and they are very proud of it because the food in their region is so delicious, Dia and Alexander, absolutely, that you would taoreru. One would fall over from eating so much delicious food. Let me tell you, it is indeed very delicious. And utilizing all of those skills that, that Joanne was teaching you on how to communicate, how to ask for menus about uh, special specials on their menu that might not have been on a Braille menu. So you need to be cautious about what you're doing and how you're asking for information, having someone read them to you. Or if like in Osaka, a region that is known for several traditional dishes, these are the things you want to ask for. So another tip would be, what are your specials or what are your specialties? In Osaka, you can't go wrong with any restaurant, whether they're casual, family style, gourmet style, fancy, any of these restaurants that you go to and just simply ask, I'll have the special. In Japanese, there is another word that you can use to request for this. And I'm sending it into the chat. Here's another Japanese word, omakase. We talked about kui, eat, and daore to fall over. We're in the Kansai area of Japan and this is the region that's known for foods that's so delicious it indeed will make one fall over. When you go to a sushi restaurant, for example, and you want to kind of be impressive to someone that you might be with, you tell the sushi chef, omakase. Omakase means to leave it up to the chef. You're putting your life, literally, and your dining experience and cuisine into the hands of a very experienced chef who spends their whole lifetime mastering their art. If there's one thing I can say about the Japanese people, their culture, their cuisine, their food, it's that they take everything with such seriousness, they perform it to the best of their ability, and they will make it perfect, as perfect as they can possibly make it for you, spending their life doing that. So omakase would mean just to leave it up to them. So that's one of the cool things that you can do at a Japanese restaurant is say, I'll leave it up to you, chef. Just make your specialty and you cannot go wrong with that. So there we have the Kansai region, which again is known for food. Now let's travel a little further over to the former capital. I know that it was Joanne or Susie who may have asked what, I think it was Susie who asked what the capital of Japan was, Tokyo. If you flip those two syllables around. Can anyone in the chat tell me what you would get? Let's reverse that. 
Let's see. Ah, Alexander's right. Michael, chiming in right away. Dia, you folks are absolutely correct. Kyoto, if you take the two words and reverse them, where we know Tokyo is the capital of Japan today, Kyoto is the old or ancient capital of Japan. So let's, let's think about what makes Kyoto so unique and special. We talked about the cuisine and the food of the region of Osaka, Kuidaore. Here's another word for you. I'm going to type into the chat so you can... Let's see. It's going to take me a second, but... All right, here we go. Another word is now in the chat. It's called Kidaore. Is there a part of that word that you recognize from a word that we learned earlier? Kui daore. What does the daore mean again? The question again is what does the daore refer to? In the second syllable, you are correct, Michael. What is that to fall over, Camille? You are absolutely correct. However, Michael, this time we're not re referring to food. Kui is the verb to eat something, and daore, like Gemma is saying, absolutely is to fall over. However, this time we're referring to ki daore. What could ki possibly mean? Let's see some of your guesses in the chat what ki daore could possibly mean as it relates to the old or ancient capital of Japan, a city known as Kyoto. Let's see some of your guesses in the chat of what you think ki daore refers to. Megan is guessing history. That would be some heavy history if it makes you fall over, but good guess. Let's keep those guesses coming. What do you think ki daore means? What does it refer to? There's something else that's so nice and so beautiful, not drinks, Brianna. <laughs> There are definitely adventures to be had, Anna, all over the scenery, Robin, good guess, but we're referring to something else that one might do so much that it would cause him to fall over, Kennedy. Any guesses? I don't see any correct guesses yet. I'm going to tell you in san, ni, ichi, or three, two, one, and that is to wear. Kiru means to put on, as in clothing. It was said, and if you think about the Japanese geisha, Japanese women back in the olden days had to wear what's called a kimono. Kimono is a traditional Japanese robe made of beautiful silk. The clothes, absolutely. So the Kyoto region, or again, the old capital of Japan, was known for their fashion. Even to today, if you go visit Kyoto, the traditional Japanese clothing or the robes that the women and men wear are so beautiful and luxurious that one would wear so much that they would tolerate it to fall over. So there's a couple of interesting facts for you about different parts of Japan and what makes them unique and special, beautiful, tasty, delicious, so much so that one would fall over from experiencing all of these wonderful things that I love to call my second home. What do I miss most about Japan? I certainly miss the food, all of the tempura, the ramen, the sushi, and I do have a number of close friends who still live there in Japan, and I definitely miss them as well. Thank you for asking that question, Brianna. And I thought I would I'm not sure how we're doing on time, Robin. You can kind of give me hand signals, but let's uh, maybe tr leave it open for a couple of minutes for questions if we have time for that. And if not, that's okay, because I've enjoyed okay. this. We are going to get into questions, but we're just going to go over one important thing very quickly. Um, and it's kind of kind of quickly. Um, and that is our chopstick lesson, because many students might have chopsticks right now with them. I know Susie and Joanne, we've all got theirs. I went to the store and got some sushi. So would you just give us a little sushi, like chopsticks lesson? Just something quick so that we can get started. Okay, so here are some tips of what to do with chopsticks, what to and what not to do. 
Oh, yes. My recommendation on holding your chopsticks, Susie, very good over there, is to hold the chopsticks a little further to the back or the top or the wider end of the chopsticks so that you can have a little better leverage as you open and close the chopsticks. So whatever grip you choose to use, and we won't go into the grip details because everyone uses chopsticks or holds them slightly differently. But in my opinion, the further back you hold them, the better control you'll have, the wider you can open them, and the stronger you'll be able to grip whatever food it is you're trying to grab. And it looks like Robin over here is already enjoying successfully using her chopsticks to dine on something traditionally Japanese. Robin? I've got some sushi, everybody. And it was so good. And I can't help it. I have been going for it this whole time. So again, if you haven't had a chance to eat, there goes Joanne. So if you haven't ever seen sushi, I'm going to pick up a roll and hold it into the camera. It's a little roll surrounded by rice. This one is stuffed with salmon and avocado. I've got it on my chopsticks, I'm piercing it in, and it's a big bite, you guys. On camera, I'm opening up my mouth so big, and I'm taking it in. Um, but because I also know Keenan has been so fun, and you guys have some other questions, we're gonna continue to watch everybody take some sushi, but then go ahead and let's just end. We've got about nine minutes. So if we've got some questions, like I already see our girl Brianna asking, go ahead and do it. Um, your extension activity is a ramen activity. It's a choose your own adventure ramen. So go ahead and do that. Keep using your chapsticks. Let's listen to Keenan tell us a little bit more and go ahead and ask questions in the chat window and we'll learn a little bit more about Japan. And I'm going to take a really big bite. Here it is, guys. Ready? Mmm. <laughs> I'll bet that tasted delicious. Okay. We're going to jumping right into questions. Brianna Engelman, and what's the most popular sushi flavor in Japan? Well, that depends on your taste, what kind of sushi you like. Sushi can be a combination of any type of seafood, vegetables, uh, fish, eggs, or anything really bizarre like sea urchin, which Robin is not eating right now, but it still looks very delicious. So it could be any number of, I, in my opinion, the fresher, the better, whatever it is. Like I mentioned earlier, omakase, you leave it up to the chef, and you can't go wrong with that. So thanks for that question, Brianna. Gemma Tiffany, let's see, in Japan is all of the food in separate plates and bowls at restaurants. Excellent question. Traditionally, a lot of the dishes in Japan, a lot of them will have their own individual plates and dishes, which makes the presentation appear very, very beautiful. But it would be important to know, like in clock terminology, what's where on your plate, the positioning to understand what's on your plate. It doesn't hurt to, to pause, ask someone to please describe what we have before you on the plate so you know in what order all of your dishes are laid out before you. Excellent question about them being in separate plates and bowls. The best Japanese food, Anna Jensen. Hmm. I would have to say it's the whatever Japanese food I'm eating at the time has got to be the best Japanese food. That's my guess. Okay, Megan, what kind of sushi is good? You're not sure you would like sushi. So perhaps you could start with some of the, uh, they actually have one made with a, a sweetened scrambled egg. It's called tamago. Tamago yaki, again, is a sweetened with a little soy. So you have that sweet and savory flavor all mixed into one with scrambled eggs. So if, if somebody doesn't like scrambled eggs, well, you might have to get another recommendation, but you can't go wrong with tamagoyaki. It's a sweet and scrambled egg that's chilled, laid on top of rice, perhaps with a little wrap of nori or seaweed on it, roasted seaweed. That would be a good recommendation you can't go wrong with. What alcohol Michael Munn wants to know to do Japanese drink? Similar to the, my favorite Japanese food is whatever I'm eating probably whatever it is they're drinking. Now, of course, in Japan, we know that they make, uh, they have famous factories for making biru. Biru is Japanese beer, of course. Another Japanese traditional alcohol is sake. But do you know what the difference between the two are as far as their origin? What does biru come from versus what does sake, sake come from? Let's see a couple 
couple of answers in the chat while I move to the next question. Let's see. Joanne would like to know if different chopsticks are used for different occasions. Not to my knowledge. I think uh, traditionally sake is rice. Leanne, you are bing bingo correct. Sake does come from rice. So there's a difference between the, the alcohols. Um, I don't know that there's too many different styles or types of chopsticks that are used for different occasions. However, a very important rule of thumb when it does come to chopstick use, there are a couple of important things and I'll go over them. One is you never stick your chopsticks into a bowl of rice. Again, you never stick your chopsticks or leave them standing up even if it's innocently there's a symbolism behind this that you would want to avoid doing this. Anybody have any guesses why chopsticks don't get stuck into rice? Let's see, I'm gonna give it a sun. Ni ichi, three, two, one. Absolutely, it is, it is disrespectful, but most especially if you understand the why. You can't really be disrespectful if it's unknown to you, so I'm gonna let you know. It is symbolic of, um, of a funeral representing uh, the passing or the death of someone is when rice cake would be uh, stuck with chopsticks. So you want to avoid chopsticks and rather lay them on the plate, on the bowl, or oftentimes a little chopstick rest, which is used to keep the eating end of your chopsticks off of the table surface. So, um, so that's rule number one. Rule number two is never pass food from one chopstick to another chopstick. Never pass food from one chopstick to another person's chopstick or receive. So that's not done. If you're going to share food, which is not uncommon in Japanese cuisine, you would take it from the serving dish onto a plate and then hand the plate to someone, but not from the chopsticks. And that, again, interestingly, as you can see, there's a very important uh, symbolism and respect that is paid to those who may have passed. So this has something to do with perhaps when the when bodies were cremated, remains may have been passed just from one chopstick to another. So in order to avoid any of those misunderstandings, you know, innocent as it may be, you don't want to pass food from one chopstick to another. Use the dish, saucer, or plate when you're passing it over. Okay, uh, let's Keenan, see. I hate to jump in, <laughs> nope, but we okay. are at the 57 mark, which means we are just about out of time. Students, I see all of your questions coming through. Um, maybe we can figure out another way that we can continue to do this. Um, but I would just like to say thank you to Keenan. We loved having you with us. Uh, so if anybody loved having Keenan join us for this leg of our amazing race, go ahead and let us know in the chat. Um, it's been super fun. I also got to eat sushi for work today. So that was a super win for all of us. Um, I just want to remind you that tomorrow is leg number three of the amazing race. And we will do a little game where we will do things around your home. So just know that you might need to get up and go get things. Tomorrow is a camera optional day. So we will encourage you to turn your cameras on, but if you can't, we understand, but we will play a game called The Quest, where you will need to go get items and come show them in your camera. Um, that is a big part of tomorrow. I already see some students saying that they love The Quest. If you cannot, don't worry. We will have things that you can still do. We just wanted to let you know. That being said, man, what a great day on The Amazing Race. Students, we are rushing back to the airport. We're back on our plane. We're buckling up because we're going somewhere else next. Thank you so much. So you gave a great recap of what we did and what we're getting ready to do. Pay attention to those emails. You've got another extension activity that will head your way tomorrow morning. So be prepared for that. We are a little slow at getting our recording up on our YouTube channel. Hopefully both will be up by tomorrow. So just stay tuned for that. Sometimes it takes us a little bit longer than we thought. And I guess Robin is also reminding you about that. Ex Robin is reminding you about the ramen extension activity. Boy, tongue twister there. Have a great day, everyone. We are off. 
in that plane to our next destination. See you all. See you later, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Bye.